if there was one predominant thing about Bob, of the million things that Bob did, the music part really counts. <laughs> invited into a uh, mambo combo they gave me directions to this mill and there's bob katie in the middle charlie to the left of katie and bob and charlie screaming at each other at the top of their lungs <laughs> so i stopped at the door i would say it was a full 10 minutes of screaming who was going to take what lead for how long and how loud it was gonna be. And then I'm saying, there's no bass player in this band. We have two guitar players. They want a keyboard, there's no bass player. Well, Bob wasn't gonna play bass. Charlie wasn't gonna play bass. I started to play bass with my left hand. I only knew three notes on every song we played. So everything we played turned into a mambo, mambo combo. That's the story. Uh, this is a Ben Harper tune that kind of expresses our wishes for Bob. Many, many happy hours solidifying the brain in this spot. What are you gonna do with the spot? Then look at it later. Look at it and cry.
as freshmen at NYU in September of 1969. In those days, we took a lot of trips with and without Timothy Leary. <laughs> we, we took several trips to Washington, D.C. to protest the Vietnam War, trips to the Fillmore East to hear the Grateful Dead. We took trips at 2 a.m. in the morning to get sandwiches from the Smiler's Deli over on 6th Avenue. There was no food nearby, so we had to make this long trek in the middle of the night. Bob always picked up tubs of Cool Whip pudding. He, he called it poodoo. Our senses of social justice were formed in this time, believing in civil rights, we were anti-war, pro-fairness, and pro-equality. Both Bob and I dropped out of college at the same time. I went to travel and work in California, Bob shortly to settle in Salem and Cambridge. I owe it to Bob that I came to visit him at Rexley Mills almost 40 years ago and ended up living my life here. Bob and I were like brothers, enjoying each other's company, encouraging and supporting each other's talents. We shared the trials of being self-taught and the excitement of youthful exploration and discovery, both of us curious and turned on by new ideas. Bob pursued pottery and ceramic sculpture, working later in bronze and wood. We have a small representation of Bob's work on the table over here. They're just wonderful pieces. Bob was prolific, a great self-promoter, his enthusiasm and creativity would win you over even before he delivered his next masterpiece, whether it was a sculpture, guitar, or motorcycle part. Mm -hmm. Through Bob and his family, I was able to expand my career in design and building. Bob was always an enthusiastic supporter of my work. Far out, amazing, incredible were words he used frequently. <laughs> I was sad when Bob and Margie and the kids moved away to Boulder, but with his intermittent visits and occasional phone calls, we still felt incredibly connected. The bond we had formed in our youth seemed like it was forever. His Cheshire cat grin was always welcoming. We shared an unconditional love and appreciation for each other. Many stories have surfaced over the past few weeks and fleas come up several times. <laughs> Joanne Matera relates the story of living at the mill early on and seeing Bob vacuuming the cracks of the floor in his room for fleas. Always, always resourceful, Bob was wearing a flea collar on each angle. <laughs> <laughs> what a genius idea, those flea collars. <laughs> I'm grateful I had a chance to share a reunion with Bob and our college roommates, Don, Ed, and Ron in San Francisco a year ago. It was nearly as if no time had passed at all. Bob always approached life with the fearlessness of a chosen and gifted child. He was generous, joyful, fun, incredibly talented and creative. Thanks to Bob, we are part of a stranger and richer world. Well, I think my friend Bob. Yes. Cheers. 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 While riding on a train going west, I fell asleep for to take my rest. I dreamed a dream that made me sad concerning myself. Yeah, the first few friends I had. I got the call about Bob on the morning of my daughter's 11th birthday. And we were together and she gave me a ton of strength all day long. And then throughout know, the course of the day I realized, you know, the most important thing to me was my family and then decided to fly away from them and went to Boulder and I wanted to give a little quickie update on that because it um, I said a number of times since then that it was 
just the most incredible, you know, sort of three or four days, I don't remember how long it was, that, of my sort of emotional life. Because, you know, coming back to be a part of that family, and we came there so, so fully and so rich. And um, so I've often said, you know, wow, what a great time. It's just a pity that Bob had to die for us to do it. Um, we did a lot of laughing and a lot of crying and then, a, and then some more of that. But the, I was Cass's godfather and um, Don Katz, uh, who was there, said, you know, because he is Josh's godfather, says, I think I get the award for worst godfather. I said, no, no, Don, that really is mine, right? But Bob had picked the two of us to be godfathers, and there we both were at a time when those guys really could use us. And as I watched them, you know, these guys that I'd left behind as, you know, young men, boys, you know, looking at them as like, whoa, these men, you know, and they just so, you know, gave their hearts up, loved their dad, thought about what he taught them, and re just kept reaching for the higher ground, reaching for the higher ground, and every step of the way, you know, and there's some tests that they're doing out there, and, but they just, you know, they just, they didn't miss a, they didn't miss a run on the ladder. And it's just such a, you know, it's just, you know, such a great thing to, to, to watch and be a part of. And so there's my little piece of those guys for you. Um, uh, the rest of the family came, they, they did the same. And Bob's mom, who I was so worried about that, you know, between her age and, and you know, she lost her husband just a, two years ago now. And, um, and she did the same thing, and it's just such a testament to who they all are as a family. And she said, I just don't think I can go to be a part of the service that we had like this. I just don't think I can go there um, to watch this happen about my son. And when it was over, she said, it's the, it's the richest moment because we found a way to do what's happening, beginning to happen here. And, you know, we brought him alive and, well, or maybe he was the whole while, you know. Um, and a couple of voices were talking about how I was Bob's brother and I was Bob's brother. And it turns out there's a lot of brothers. <laughs> this guy gave it. He loved big and he loved, um, you know, anybody that was willing to. And uh, the sense of, uh, well, it was time, and well, this, you know, God, you know, it, uh, it's just the consequence we pay for life, and, it, and it's, a, it's a harsh one to have to give. Um, but here we are, making the best of it, and um, then and thanks for letting me be a part of this one, too. By the old wooden stove where our hats were hung, our words were told, our songs were sung, where we loved for nothing and were satisfied, joking and talking about the world outside. I came to Rexley uh, from out west, and I lived in a bunch of communes and with various levels of success and failure, and suddenly found myself one winter uh, sleeping between two mattresses, uh, trying to keep warm and, and make our first wood stove. The second winter we were there, the second winter we wintered over, uh, I believe Bob was there that winter, and uh, our neighbor had given us permission to go on his property, Mr. Patrick, and cut all the rotten elm we wanted for free. Well, we just thought that was the greatest thing anyone had ever done for us, but we were actually eliminating his rotten trees. And uh, so we, John and I and Bob, and John Campanelli, and oh, I don't know who else was there, but in the dead of winter, we were slogging through snow up to our crotches and cutting down dead elms, and we got these chunks back to the mill, and of course now we have to split the wood. And uh, what a surprise, uh, punky swamp elm doesn't split. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
This is free wood, but it won't fit in the door of our stores. So Bob, uh, Bob was, was fastidious about this. He got out a sledgehammer, and we were trying to splitting malls, and he said, no, the way to do this is wedges. So he went up to the hardware store and bought a, a truckload of wedges and brought them back. And we started driving wedges into these logs, and the logs would eat eight or 10 wedges and never split. Just, but they got a lot heavier. Well, when we finally split them, the remaining log would, of course, fit through the door of the stove. Uh, but it was Bob's technique, and I'll never forget this. Bob said, I'll just keep buying wedges, and then when I burn the log, I can retrieve the wedges out of the ashes. And I shook my head, and I just thought to myself, this guy is totally unique. I've never seen anything like him. Uh, he did it all with a, you know, we all did it with a smile on our face. It was pretty lean years back then, and Bob was never one to complain. He, uh, he got to naming, we had plastic up in the beams, um, that was our form of, of uh, we had old rotten insulation and, and six mil plastic. And, and Bob, uh, the, the rats would use the plastic as their throughway. So Bob started naming the rats and he actually had identified quite a few of them. And uh, you know, he'd know when somebody had a family and there were new rats, it was great. <laughs> Bob made living at the mill probably one of the most exciting things in the world because it was disaster after disaster at the mill. Uh, there was never a day when we ever were 100% successful. But Bob would just, you know, th he was a thrill. He was, and I think Charlie said it, uh, and, and Andrew, he was all about fun. And if it wasn't fun, he wasn't gonna do it. So he made everything fun from uh, boiling water to, uh, you know, we, we had 99 cent six packs back then, of beer, of near beer, I guess it was. and. Um, We'd sit around and drink those about six inches away from the stove, burning wet punky on. But, uh, but I'll never forget that Bob taking these wedges out. Of course, now you've heated a wedge, a cast wedge, so you, when you hit it with a sledgehammer, it turns into a hand grenade. You know. But Bob had quite a collection by the end of that winter. He, uh, probably, the thing I remember most about Bob is he became a master in a very short time. Um, he knew nothing about nothing when he showed up. I, this man was totally without skill one of, sur of survival outside of Scarsdale. He was bereft. He became a master in a couple of years and uh, he became one of the finest uh, ceramicists I, I believe I've ever, I've ever known. He, he quickly left it at a point where he was making some beautiful work and went, went on to bronzes. Um, we were all at a loss because his, his incised pottery was just magnificent. And uh, he went on to uh, expose his inner self to the rest of us with his sculptures. And uh, I'm sorry to say some of mine have long since turned back to dust. But uh, Bob taught me how to have fun. I never had fun in a commune before I met Bob. <laughs> With hungry hearts through the heat and cold We never much thought we could get very old We thought we could sing forever and far Our chances really are just a million to one Bob uh, showed up at the mill as Chip said, just totally unprepared for hard work. And he got out of his car, and I was thinking about that as soon as I heard about Bob's, remembering that moment when he stepped out of his car and said, I'm gonna be here. I wanna do what needs to be done. What needs to be done? And I said, well, there's a truckload of clay that needs to be unloaded in 100 pound bags and stuff. And he reached over there and he grabs the bag, and <laughs> his back is gone, his back is gone. <laughs> the first one, day one. And you know, I saw him 30 years after that. He said, remember that time you made me lift that clay and broke my back? <laughs> but I don't want to talk about Bob as a worker. I want to talk about something I think we've all experienced in Bob, and that's the four-year-old that lived, the creative four-year-old that lived uh, and thrived in him. And I think everybody has experienced that in one way or another. I know I 
did. The four-year-old Bob Epstein thrived. I was out cutting wood all day long and hungry and came back to the mill and Bob had cooked this big platter of brownies. And Bob had a special way of cooking brownies. <laughs> and I didn't know it. <laughs> and I was starving. <laughs> and so I ate a half a dozen. <laughs> and then I became the four-year-old. <laughs> and literally was crawling on the floor totally at ease and happy with the fact that all these adults around me were going to take care of all the responsibilities. I had no responsibilities. I was four years old, literally. It was wonderful. I stayed there as long as I could. And then something in me realized, wait a minute, you can't, you, you can't do this. You got to go back. You got, you got responsibilities. So I tried. I tried to come back, and it just didn't work. And so I had a bad trip, a quote, bad trip, the only one I've ever had. And Bob recognized that, and he said, come here, John. And he took me upstairs to his warm water bed. Remember that? <laughs> and he laid me down in his warm water bed, and he said, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be fine. He put some music on. And I laid there for two days. <laughs> Couldn't decide if I was going to be four or 34. And Bob pulled me out of that, I think. <laughs> but I'd like to think that there's a piece of Bob in all of us that's, that he engendered, that's four years old. And so, if you find yourself doing something that a four-year-old would do, it might just be a continuation of Bob Epstein and you. And I believe that's going to happen with all of us, hopefully. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I lived next to Bob for the whole time that he moved in to the time he moved out. And since he passed away, I can think of like a zillion stories. And one of, the, one of the things that stood out in my mind was that Bob was very creative, very, very creative. A lot of people thought that Bob didn't really work a lot. But the wheels were always moving. The car wasn't moving, but the wheels were spinning. <laughs> he was really very, he always worked really a lot. But he also had this one other thing that I remember the most about Bob is that he, he had a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. For a while, we used to go to the dump. That's, that's where you used to just throw your garbage out. And we would go to the dump because we were sharing, you know, a truck. And I would take my poultry little one garbage can, and he would have like a truckload of stuff. You know, because Margie was telling him, Bob, get rid of this stuff. And we'd go to the dump, and we'd dump out the stuff, and he'd start to look in boxes and find stuff. This is a trait of Bob. He, was a, he could find stuff. And he would convince you that that stuff was really worthwhile, bringing back. So we would end up bringing back a truck bigger than the one that we took, you know? And I finally had to ease my way out of, you know, our weekly trip to the dump, because that would take the rest of the day, too. And Margie was on my case, whatever. But Bob did have, like, a little bit of a bad back, and, and so did I. And so when Bob got into the Bronze Age, <laughs> it got to be a little bit of a problem. He would call me up, you know, and, and say, can you give me a hand, you know, I need to move this three-ton piece of bronze, and I don't have any way to move it. And, and we, we would get there, you know, oh, no, my back is out. And so um, that's uh, the day that I found out that he had passed away. Um, I went on a trip, a hiking trip by myself in, in Hoosick Falls, and I actually got a little lost. And I came out on the wrong trail, very steep trail. And I said, oh, you know, I called my wife, can you come pick me up? But I, she didn't answer the phone. Now, do I walk around or do I go back up this hill? 
and it was really very steep and my heart was pounding and I kept thinking about Bob, you know. I don't want to join him. <laughs> maybe I'll, uh, I'll cut it here. So maybe he was sending me a message. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> As easy it was to turn black from white. It was all that easy to tell wrong from right. And our choices, there were few, so the thought never, ever hit. At the one road we traveled, would a shadow split? The night that Bob died, I mean, he died. Anyway, the moon woke me up, and um, I found out later that it was at the same time that Bob died. But, you know, I didn't know. But the very cool thing that happened that night, um, the night of the 11th, around, it was around 11 or 11.30, our time on the 11th. And I don't know if anybody saw the moon, but it was this big moon. And it also had this really big ring around it. And, you know, I went outside and I was thinking about Bob. And all of a sudden there's this, um, this arc of light, I mean, this huge arc of light that was just headed off to the southwest, and um, it also, where the arc was joining the, the ring, it was, um, you know, that phenomenon where um, the ice crystals are making color. So it was very cool that to have this ring around the moon with all this glitter light in color. And I immediately thought it was Bob saying, look, here I am, I'm okay. You know, this is all right. This is a, uh, uh, a magical mystery motorcycle tour. <laughs> and so, and I felt okay, even though I cried. And, you know, I think Bob is okay. Now many a year has passed and gone. And many a gamble has been lost and won. And many a road taken by many a first friend. And each one he has never seen again. I'm not going to cry because I'm going to tell you about one short, precious memory of Bob. I, being an older person, uh, expect some interest in a seed that some of you may know about. And Bob said, oh, I've got some of those. <laughs> well, I guess I'll plant some of those. Good idea. So I went out in my corn patch and I planted some of these wonderful little seeds. And they grew and they grew and the corn grew. And I had all these big things, but some of them had a great big thing of buds. Somebody said. So I said to our friend Dave Norman, what do I do with these things now? And he said, well, we'll call Bob. <laughs> well, here comes Bob. Where are they, Nola? Come on, Bob, out into the corn patch. And Bob looked around and said, oh my God, look at those, look at those beautiful things. And he got into my corn patch and he said, but they need more light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Bob. You know, uh, we're there to play the music that, you know, we were all like, supposed to be there playing with him. And there's going to be, you know, a hundred people from all around the neighbor, you know, all around the area. And Bob's got a place that's, you know, got a main road here and a main road here. I mean, it's not like highway road, but we're talking about Boulder, Colorado. And somebody did say about his, you know, ability with a medical license. Well, his license went on to being able to actually plant some more of those little seeds. A, a certain amount. Well, I get there and the guys are like, well, I don't know, what do you think? We should we be worried about that? Right there, about between here and the house, and there's the studio. I'm like, yeah, we might want to like do a little something about the 14 of these things that are looking like this. And so we had to like drag out fencing and sort of bury it right before our gathering just to make sure that even though the, the first three plants might have been legal, you know, the other ones, you know. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish in vain 
that we could sit simply in that room again. Ten thousand dollars at the drop of a goddamn hat. I would give it all gladly if our lives could be like that. So for those who don't know me, I'm Jessica, I'm John's daughter and uh, Edith Donovan's daughter and um, I was born at the mill, well not at the mill, but I was raised there for the first five years of my life. And my dad told me that when uh, Bob showed up, one of his favorite things to do was to have me on his shoulders and then to run. <laughs> as fast as he could, around corners, <laughs> up and down stairs. And I think it, it, it freaked my dad out a little bit. Um, out of here. <laughs> but I think, I'm sure I loved it, and I know Bob loved uh, doing it as well. But, I, you know, I have, I'm a, a little different generation, and I have a, um, a different relationship with Bob, especially since I was at school in Boulder when his family moved out there. And I ended up doing a lot of childcare for them. And so I saw his boys. Uh, I think Alex was about two or three when they first moved out there. Uh, I saw his boys grow and spent a lot of time with them, especially Josh and Alex. And I went back there a week after the service. Dahlia and my daughter and I went out there. Uh, I couldn't make it for the service, but I knew I wanted to see uh, Marjorie and the kids. And as Charlie said, <laughs> I walked in the door and Josh had delayed his um, flight out so that he could see me that night. And I walked in the door and <laughs> they're all <laughs> so tall and such men. And I think Charlie actually said a lot of what I'm gonna say. I was just so struck by their love for their father and their ability to um, do right by him. And what's, what's better than that, so.